Okay, Lamar's going to throw the ball in over to the Devin Williams. Devin Williams over to Michael Manette. Michael looks over to Devin. Devin fakes a little bit. Shake and bake. Here we go. Oh! Devin Williams! Oh, my goodness. Welcome to New Mexico is a Basketball State podcast hosted by me, Russell E. Grulay. I got to thank you guys for coming back. Thank you, viewers. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, we're going to talk today about Greg Heyer, former New Mexico State basketball coach, who just had his arbitration meeting with New Mexico State about a month ago. And it was reported by ESPN's Myron Medcalf, who uh, wrote a really nice article, actually, and gave us a lot of detail. And uh, we're, we're getting a, a view of what has happened all last year when Greg Heyer was head coach of New Mexico State. We're getting it from his viewpoint now. Now that we've uh, seen it from New Mexico State's viewpoint and how the El Paso Las Cruces media presented it, we're now going to see it from Greg Heyer's point of view. And this is very interesting. He is saying that it was a toxic secretive culture at New Mexico State. He uh, he has a lot of uh, accusations for uh, about what happened at New Mexico State and we're going to go through them. It's kind of a complicated timeline. It uh, <clears throat> it, it cross references across a lot of things incidents that happened last season that led to his firing. And uh, we're going to go through it. And we're going to just start with the first. When Greg Heyer was first interviewed, Greg Heyer stated that New Mexico State did not tell him about the APR issues, which is the academic progress report of uh, New Mexico State basketball players, which had dropped during COVID-19. So he's saying that, look, they were bad. I had to get them up. And... When it comes to academics, if you don't have the grades, you can't play. And that affects the roster. And that affects the coach's ability to set up a team, to be able to play, to be able to win, to be able to get to conference championships. It affects everything. That APR is extremely important. And he's saying that it was very low and they didn't bother to tell him that in the interview that he had with them. Now, New Mexico State attorneys came back and said, well... You didn't bother to ask those questions. And um, to me, that's kind of shocking, to be honest with you, because it would seem natural that if you're going to hire somebody to handle a program that generates millions of dollars and uh, is very influential across a region like New Mexico and the Southwest, you would give them all the relevant information they would need in order to be successful. That's the way I would think they would do it. It would make sense to me if you're going to hire somebody. You tell them, hey, we got this problem, this problem, and that problem. And um, you're going to have to fix this and deal with this in order to reach our, this is our expectations. He's saying they didn't do that. And they're just accusing him of not asking the question. So it's his fault, right? Um at, to me, that's an omission of guilt by the New Mexico State Administration right there. And so, you, it, it's, it's very, uh, it, it just shows this pattern that I'm going to go over as we go through this timeline. Now, Greg Heyer saying that, hey, I was a sacrificial lamb, the scapegoat. And that's been kind of the words used throughout this article, along with the Associated Press who picked it up and Yahoo News picked it up also. So you've got three different articles and I'll, I'll see if I can put them in the links down below so you can read those articles and kind of get an idea of what is being talked about. So he goes from there. He starts up the program. It's going good. And I'm looking at my cheat sheets to remember. There's so much to remember. He goes from there, and then there's the Lobo Aggie football rivalry. And it's being the game's being played last season in Las Cruces, and there's a brawl between Mike Peak and UNM student Brandon Travis. There were several basketball players from New Mexico State that played that uh, were also involved in that brawl. And uh, the next day, Greg Heyer is saying that he's at athletic director Mario Mo Mosia's house 
and they're looking at the video and Mosia saying, hey, whooping up on some Lobos, right? You know, that's I guess that's how uh, hardcore this is, the rivalry. And so Greg Heyer wants to suspend these players, Mike Peak and uh, the other the other players involved in that brawl. And he's saying that Mario Mosia wouldn't allow him to do that. And he's saying that it was more of a deal of where, well, hey, we need to win this year, some conference championships, things of that nature. And, uh, you know, looking back on it for myself, I kept wondering why Greg Heyer hadn't suspended Mike Peak during that time with that football brawl. In fact, I found out about it. Through, uh, through various websites, message boards uh, of all places. And it was very odd. And I kept wondering to myself, why didn't he suspend these players? Because every, you know, from following college athletics since the 80s, the 1980s, uh, almost every D1 coach has suspended somebody for a fight it's almost uh it's it's almost it's common occurrence it's it's almost it's natural to do that to suspend them it would be common sense really when you think about it if they're at fault and they get involved in something like that well that looks bad on the university looks bad on the program therefore they they get suspended and they should well these guys were not suspended. Mike Peake and those other players that were involved. Again, I don't know their names in the in the brawl. I wasn't able to find that information, and it's not too relevant. So we go from there, and apparently that brawl stirs up emotions, and uh, it creates what became the biggest incident in the Greg Heyer tenure at New Mexico State, and that was the night before. The Lobo Aggie basketball game at the pit. And there was a shooting. Okay. A young lady lures Mike Peak through a, a website to the UNM campus where Brandon Travis, a UNM student, along with two other uh, men, teenagers, not sure. They go and they assault him with a bat and things of that nature. They, Brandon Travis pulls out a gun, shoots Mike Peake. Mike Peake shoots back and kills Brandon Travis in self-defense. If Mike Peake hadn't had a gun, he wouldn't be here today. That's for sure. That's for sure. Then a yellow Camaro with a young lady driving it with three other players shows up on the scene to pick up Mike Peake and all his uh, belongings, his tablet, those things were thrown in the trunk of the car. And Mike peeks off to the hospital. <coughs> and imagine Greg Heyer having to wake up to this early, early in the morning. And then there became kind of a confusing pandemonium after that with the Aggie basketball team leaving in the morning, heading back to Las Cruces, and New Mexico State Police pull them over just to, uh, I guess, get some uh, some evidence. But they didn't take Mike Peake's phone, which was on the bus. The gun Mike Peake used was back at the hotel in Albuquerque, which Dominic Taylor, associate head coach, at the time under Mike uh, under uh, Greg Heyer's staff, gives it to police. Now, key point here, nobody was charged. Nobody was charged at all. In fact, uh, anything that was, uh, I think there might have been a charge against Mike Peake, but it was dropped. Okay. So nobody was charged. All right. Greg Heyer said he left Saturday, that Saturday morning because he feared retaliation against the Aggie basketball team. And that, that, that might be pretty understandable given that the information, the news was coming out and, and given how, I guess, this rivalry stirs up those kind of emotions, that sort of thing. That's somewhat understandable. New Mexico State Police have never said that they detained the team and told them to wait there and stay there. And frankly, it doesn't make sense for them to stay any longer if there's not a game, which, by the way, was canceled. So they headed back to Las Cruces. Greg Heyer says that's when New Mexico State seized control of the program. Okay. 
He says he was no longer allowed to discipline players. That's what he is stating there. And he says that he wanted to suspend the three players that were in that yellow Camaro that picked up Mike Peake that night after the shooting, which took him to the hospital. Okay, you follow along so far? It's a lot of stuff. So, he says he was not able to suspend them. Now, New Mexico State attorneys are saying, well, he failed to act, and so therefore New Mexico State had to take over the program because he failed to in enforce discipline. Now, the AP article states that those three players were suspended by New Mexico State administration. Greg Heyer saying he wasn't allowed to do it, but they did it, okay? They the being the administration of New Mexico State. So, now that we've gotten that clear, that's just one part. Now we're moving on down the timeline here. We're getting to hazing allegations, all right? Hazing sexual assault and hazing allegations. This is where it gets interesting, all right? We're dealing now with allegations that were uh, coming from William Deuce Benjamin and Oninewu. I believe the ESPN article misspelled Oninewu's uh, first name, so I'm not going to try to pronounce it. But they came forth with allegations which happened uh, at, at certain times during that season while they were on the basketball team. Those allegations were reported to the Office of Institutional Equity, which handles Title IX investigations, discrimination. They, uh, they basically, in, a, in kind of in a nutshell, they deal with... Uh, Sexual allegations of a sexual nature, discrimination, they determine if somebody said something racist or not, or this or that. O I E is what they're called for short. Office of Institutional Equity. They are, uh, they're run by a, a professor of anthropology and, uh, it's kind of interesting. I don't, I, I have to ask the question. Well, why didn't New Mexico State Campus Police handle this investigation? Because these allegations appear to be a crimes, actual crimes. When somebody forces themselves on somebody else against their will and does things to them, that is considered a crime. Hazing is considered a crime. It's not allowed in the U.S. military. It's not allowed in society. <coughs> Excuse me. So, I'm wondering why this, why this office is doing this, uh, headed by a professor of anthropology of all things. But don't worry, he has equity investigative experience, which take it for whatever it means. Okay. So I find that investigation kind of, uh, kind of interesting, kind of weird. I don't know why they wouldn't have the campus police. Now, Greg Heyer, like I said, this goes back to Greg Heyer. Like I said, he was said that he was unaware of these allegations for about a month. <clears throat> In William Deuce's, uh, William Deuce Benjamin's lawsuit, he states that he told Greg Heyer and Greg Heyer said, well, what do you want me to do about it? Uh, there was more to that. There's more context. I'm sure I just not able to find it. Now he's saying that he was unaware. New Mexico State. Administration acknowledges that uh, the OIE would not be able to tell him due to Title IX and school policies. Okay? They would not be able to tell him. Now, as all this is going on, Greg Heyer is getting smacked by the El Paso Las Cruces media. And he's getting smacked pretty good. And it's going national. Anytime you have a shooting, anytime you have those situations coming out, it's going to go national, especially at a program that's fairly large like New Mexico State. So he's getting smacked by them. And uh, on a side note, I kept wondering why they weren't able to get quotes from him or the players. It just seemed so odd. So it just seemed kind of one-sided. That's why I'm doing this 
podcast and you're focusing on this topic even more because it's still going to go on till 2024 and we're going to get to that. Remember, we're following the timeline. So the hazing allegations went on and then Greg Heyer was fired before the investigation of the OIE was finished, okay? New Mexico State says that he failed to cooperate and failed to to help them in this investigation. He's saying my former lawyer was not available, therefore I was not going to appear until I had legal representation. At this time, it makes sense that he would want legal representation because... If he say if what he's saying is true that he lost his uh, he lost control discipline of the program, then he knows that he's probably on his way out, and he wants to be able to legally protect himself like any rational person would. Honestly, any rational person would want to protect themselves in this type of situation. So he is fired with cause. The Las Cruces media reports that, well, okay, they don't know what clauses yet. Oh, but don't worry. They know which clauses they are, but they don't know. They're trying to figure out which ones to use and this and that and da-da-da. So basically, they didn't really know. Honestly, they didn't really know. It's like they had to kind of manufacture it in a way to figure out how they were going to fire him and protect themselves legally. That's that's where kind of the issues were, and um, you know these uh, the what what he's saying here is that this whole thing has caused him economic hardship. Okay, it has also caused a lot of hardship for the Benjamins and Odenewu. Okay, so after he's been fired, William Benjamin goes and he does a lawsuit against New Mexico State and Greg Heyer at the time when he originally files. He then drops Greg Heyer from the lawsuit, which is interesting that he would drop him from the lawsuit, but he did. Okay, so after they go through it, the state of New Mexico immediately pays out to the Benjamins and Odenewu $8 $8 million. $8 million. They didn't even want to go to trial. They didn't want, no, no, you're wrong. No, they gave them $8 million. So there definitely appears to be some stuff going on that happened there as far as the hazing allegations are concerned. Now, New Mexico Attorney General Raul Torres is saying that they will not uh, have their investigation finished till 2024. And he said that there would likely be some charges. So this is getting very interesting. What is also very interesting is that former Chancellor Dan Arviso goes out and says, I am disgusted by these allegations. And he he puts on a show. And then he continues to allow the team to practice long after Greg Heyer has left campus. They continue to still work out. The players that have been alleged to have committed these uh, these acts are still practicing and working out. Yet, Dan Arviso is outraged. Dan Arviso, as I said, former Chancellor Dan Arviso, head of New Mexico State, on the last day of his tenure, signs a five-year contract extension for athletic director Mario Mosia which he had one year already left, so he now is going to be there for six years. Now, here's another interesting point. The state of New Mexico has decided not to pay Mario Macia until the investigation of Attorney General Raul Torres is over. Mario Macia is being paid right now by an Aggie donor club, okay? So, there have been two big actions by the state of New Mexico right now. One is they've paid out $8 million in settlement. Two, they're not paying Mario Macia. So, this is getting really interesting. Now, we have this arbitration hearing scheduled for 2024 for Greg Heyer. Like I said, he is claiming economic hardship, <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, 
He is claiming economic hardship. He is claiming that he has gone through an awful lot and that he is unable to get a lot of work within the coaching industry in college athletics. He was able to land a job at Junior College Mineral Area, which is uh, in Missouri, I believe. He he is only being paid right now 50000 He was paid in New Mexico State 300000 So he went from 300000 to 50000 And as required by the contract, his contract with New Mexico State, this is why we're having this arbitration meeting, which happened last month. He's going to have his hearing, his final hearing, in 2024. So this thing is going to continue on, folks. We're going to still hear more about this. And we're going to hear an awful lot. And I think it's going to be explosive. I think we're going to have charges. I think we're we're going to see if Greg Hire is what he's saying is true. And I tend to believe that it is true to some extent. It seems to me that he really was actually the scapegoat. You look at the media and the way they presented him and the way they went after him, it was just it was just very odd that they were not able to get quotes from him or any of those play, 10 plus players on the basketball team or the managers or anybody of that nature. Their timing was impeccable throughout the whole time, whole thing when they would break stories right in the middle of games where most people would be watching, it was all, it all seemed to be kind of designed as a way to make it look like Greg Heyer was the bad guy. He's the bad guy, is what they're saying. And they, uh, they still went after him after this arbitration meeting. They still said, well, he claimed full responsibility after the Mike Peake shooting. Sure. Okay. Yeah, he said that. But, Let's find out if what he's saying here is true. Let's find out if what he's saying is actually true. Was he stripped of uh, all disciplinary duties? Was the program seized from his control? Let's see. I mean, he's basically working there with uh, no way to discipline anybody because nobody's telling about hazing allegations due to policies and due to this office and their investigation. And, uh, you know, when you look at the causes, uh, the causes that, that they used in order to fire him, one says material significant repetitive violation or breach by coach of his agreement, rules or regulations. Okay. What rules did he actually break? What rules did he actually break? If he couldn't discipline anybody or this or that, then what rules did he actually break? I'm just curious. I'm just asking a question. I'm just asking the questions. Coaches actions or inactions which permit, encourage, condone fraudulent or dishonest acts, but this is the second clause. By any person in any matter relating to any matter relating to the program or compliance with rules, provided that coach had actual knowledge of such fraudulent and dishonest acts or reasonably should have known about such fraudulent or dishonest acts. Well, they're admitting that they couldn't tell him about the hazing allegations. That's what they're admitting. They're saying due to Title IX and their, uh, policies, and even Dan Arvisa, former Chancellor Dan Arvisa, says, well, perhaps we need to change them. That's what he said, okay? That's his words. Now, they're saying on this other one, this final clause, commission of or participation in by coach of any act, situation, occurrence, which in university's reasonable judgment brings coaching to public disrepute, contempt, scandal, or ridicule. Well, uh, the media certainly helped with that. <laughs> the media certainly helped with that, and they certainly went after him on that, okay? And when you look at what he's saying and what they're saying, we got two different stories. And it kind of makes sense to me why William Benjamin would drop him from the lawsuit now after reading these articles from ESPN, the AP Associated Press, and Yahoo News. It kind of makes sense now more to me why the things happen like they did. And uh, I think that 
The real investigation that's going to matter is New Mexico State Attorney General Raul Torres' investigation and what he comes up with. Because it looks like there's an awful lot of guilty parties within the administration of New Mexico State. And like I've said before in previous episodes, I've said, look, it, appear, it appears to me that the administration is colluding with the media in Las Cruces and El Paso. To get this guy out. That's what it appears to me. And I've said this for the last six plus months. Six. I would say the last year I've been saying that. And that's what it appears to me. That definitely that third cause right there. Kind of does it for me. Okay. That's how I'm looking at it. There was another investigation done by a law firm. That I believe New Mexico State hired. And all they could come up to, come the only conclusion they could come to is that, oh, there's problems in the basketball program. Well, duh, you know? <laughs> and now this OIE investigation, Title IX uh, investigation, I don't think that's going to have much punch. The one that's going to matter is the New Mexico State Attorney General's investigation and what they come up with. Is Mario Messia... Is, is he going to be uh, able to keep his job? They're not paying him. Okay, folks, they're not paying him. The Aggie Donor Club is paying him. What about Dan Arviso? Uh, are they going to look at him? Are they going to look at his actions? They know something because the state of New Mexico paid out $8 million to settle a lawsuit that quick. They did not want it to go to trial. Okay, they paid it out. So, as I read all of this... Uh, I'm ready for the next round to see if uh, if what Greg Heyer is saying true, which I tend to believe. I tend to believe over 50% that he's telling the truth. Did he make some mistakes? Sure, we all make mistakes. Did the uh, New Mexico State Administration make some mistakes? Yeah, I, am at, I think so. I think so. But in their responses to him, they tend to... Admit, they're admitting that, yeah, we didn't tell you about the APR, but you should have asked, right? Okay. Yeah, we suspended those players after the Mike Peak shooting. We didn't tell you about the hazing allegations because of our policies, because of Title IX. We didn't tell you about all that, okay? So, let's see what happens in 2024. But folks, I would ask you to look closer at this because this isn't over. Now, let's move on. <laughs> I'm going to talk about um, the NMAA's Bylaw, it, it's two-strike bylaw, which they had put into play this year. They're one of only three states to do it. Uh, some some more schools got some strikes, you know, strike one, strike two, you know. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to get a little bit of a take on that. I'm going to give you some inter interesting information on that. All right, so I'm going to rest my voice for a quick second and we'll get to that. All right, cool. Now, you know, I, I'm going to talk about the NMAA now that we've talked about Greg Hire and the New Mexico State situation. Now, now we're going to deal with uh, the NMAA. They just recently gave another uh, strike to Highland High School. I believe it was soccer and also a strike to the fan base. And so, so now we're, we're beginning to rack up some strikes. So there might be some more. I just haven't heard of any being reported. So as I look at it, just, just another take. I want to reiterate something that I've said in the previous, uh, podcast, episode 25. I, I, you know, you don't, you don't, you punish the people that, Commit, uh, commit the bad behavior. They run out into the field and do things they're not supposed to do. You punish them. You, uh, you don't punish the people that don't do that. You, this, this bylaw, I, I really don't like it because it, it seems to just kind of one fatal swoop. You're all punished. You're all, you're all going to be dealt with because, uh, this person over here. Or that person over there did this or that. And what I'm seeing in the comment section, uh, when I see these violations or whatever they call them, when I see 
these things happen, people would be like, well, what about what they did over there? They're the ones that instigated it. They're the ones that did this. They're the ones that did this. And then it, it leads me to wonder about the appeals process. How do you appeal this? How, how do you, uh, how do you deal with it? And, and from the looks of things, it seems like it's a very difficult appeals process. I mean, I looked at the NMAA's uh, handbook and, and basically you've got to get, uh, a letter going 10 pages or less within 14 days and you got to get a school representative, things of that nature and, you got to deal with all of that and hope that you can get a committee hearing by that time. And if that doesn't work out, you go to a board of directors. Now, here's here's the interesting thing about all of it. If you're a parent, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're a parent and you're a, you have student athletes, you got to go through a lot to appeal any decision by the NMAA. So, you know, therefore, you need to know who you're dealing with. You're you're dealing with a voluntary nonprofit educational organization. By the way, the NFL was a nonprofit until 2015. Okay, same thing. You're dealing with an organiza- organization that is a nonprofit voluntary educational organization given its authority through the state legislator overseen by the New Mexico Public Education Department. A committee is uh, elected every, it looks like every year or so. Uh, I don't know the exact uh, process of that. And then there's a board of directors, which is uh, school superintendents. Okay. So you essentially have to deal with that. Now, the public education department has no say in the internal workings of the NMAA, a nonprofit that is governing our high school athletics. Okay. They have really no say. If you do an appeal, you're going to have to get the school on board and you're going to have to pay them $250 to meet with a, a committee. Okay, you have to pay an appeal fee to meet with a committee if you're a, a parent of a student athlete. Okay, and if they agree with you, then you get your money back. Great. If they don't, they keep the money. It's the same thing if you go and you have to appeal to a board of directors. It's now $500. And if you, if they agree with you, you get your money back. And my question is, is, is why are you even doing an appeal fee? If you're going to give them their money back after you've agreed with them, after you've agreed with the parent and the student athlete, and you're going to give them their money back, why did you need it in the first place? Why are you even doing it? Uh, is it a, a deterrent or something of that nature? I mean, why? You know, honestly, why? That's, that's, that's the one thing that really stood out for me. And, and when you look at it, the, uh, school's not going to really be able to do much for you, dear parent of student athlete, because they're a member of the NMAA. They are basically in a position where, where they pretty much have to go by whatever a, the director of the NMAA decides, pretty much. And, uh, or else there might be ramifications. So I, I don't really see them being able to back you up or anything like that if they agree with you. You're going to go through an ordeal, in my opinion. That's what it looks like to me when I look at these appeal procedures. And I'm posting them on here so you can read all this. And it's a little bit of legalese. And uh, it's it's frankly... Uh, it's frankly interesting how this 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 is all going, and I'm gonna. I I think we're gonna start seeing more appeals as this thing goes on. And by the way, we're we're one of only three states that that do this out of fifty states. And like I've said, a simple solution should be secure extra security. Things of that nature, having your deputy sheriffs, having your police there, and APS police does a really great job at APS athletics, and and that's how I look at it. Okay, that's how I see it. I uh, I just I just uh, think that this bylaw we're gonna have more and more issues with it, and I think it was voted in based off of emotion and not really thinking about it. But I wanted to let you know that 
this appeals process is going to be pretty, pretty much, uh, it's going to be difficult. It's going to, it already says it's difficult. It, it, reading it, it, it is definitely going to be difficult. And I, I think you parent and of student athlete are going to be all alone in it pretty much. And you're going to have to pay out some money. And I'm just asking why they're even asking you for an appeal fee. That's, that's all I'm asking as far as the NMAA is concerned. And I'm sure we're going to have some more strikes coming up. Uh, and I guess they're trying to manipulate you into policing yourselves or something like that or this and that. But uh, honestly, it, it comes down to who has the authority at games. Officials, referees, school officials, and security. And of course, law enforcement if they're present. I just, I've always thought that you would just simply up that if you need to, if you're having an uptick in bad behavior. That's the way I see it. I don't see a need to go and punish everybody else or put a strike against uh, a fan base or put a strike against a team and force them to forfeit or this or that. So that that's where I'm looking at it. But, you know. These type of things, a lot of people need to, to look into the NMAA and who's actually governing their high school athletics and actually read these documents and look at them critically. Because, you know, when I talk to coaches and I talk to school administrators, it, it almost seems to me like they're not really able to freely speak publicly about what they think. They're not really able to do that. It's just like, hey, I'm glad you're saying it because I can't. That's what I'm seeing. And, and, and it looks to me like, like that's been the culture that's been created here in New Mexico. I mean, when I look back on, on certain court cases, cause the NMAA was taken to court, in fact, you know, and just to give you an example, former head coach of Clovis High School basketball was Jaden Isler took on the NMAA about a decade ago and he won. They suspended him for a whole season and the court ruled that uh, they basically did it off of suspicion and not actual fact. It's, it's a fascinating case and it gives you a look into the NMAA. And of course, back in the day, you had people like Fabian Ray, Royball who transferred from Highland, which is South Albuquerque, all the way to Santa Fe and had to sit out a year. I mean, you, you had stuff like that. So I think we just need to keep looking at it. And asking more and more questions and, and dear parent of student athlete, definitely read all this stuff. If you got some time, it takes about an hour, 30 minutes or so. If you got some time after work, read all this stuff and, and see if you actually agree with it. Okay. Because you're, you're dealing with a, a nonprofit essentially. One that from what I understand and correct me if I'm wrong has the ability to dissolve itself. Right now as I'm speaking, okay? Right now as I'm speaking. So they, so definitely look at it. I mean, there's, there's other issues with the NMA, especially me personally, that, uh, I think are, uh, detrimental as far as exposure of student athletes. Uh, a lot of student athletes don't ever get pictures of themselves playing. In fact, I only have like five pictures of me ever playing back in, uh, 94, 92, 1993, long time ago. Okay. And I, I know it means a lot to, to a lot of young people to see themselves in uniform in action in a game. And, uh, frankly, it, it's, Difficult to get a media pass because they don't issue one to videographers and photographers. They don't issue those to them. And you would think they would want more exposure. But as of right now, they don't issue those passes. So it's a lot, it's a lot more difficult to, to get that type of exposure for kids because the videographers and the photographers have to, to find different ways of doing it. Because those media passes give them access to where the best shots are. So those are other issues. There's a lot of issues there that definitely need to be looked at and talked about. And I think we're going to keep on talking about these bylaws because I don't think we've hit, I, I don't think we've had one that's really, really controversial yet, but it's coming. I, I'm almost certain it's going to come. It, like I, like I said months ago when this thing got enacted, one of them is going to be big and it's coming. 
So that's just my take on that. And then I'm going to move on. You know, I don't want to spend too much time with them. But now that that's all happened, we got some great stuff happening in uh, high school basketball. We've got some players that are really blowing up on the national scene. And that's Jalen Holland of Los Lunas who is just garnering up offer after offer after offer. In fact, ESPN Top 60, which does a Top 60 for the class of 25, which Jalen Holland is in, also does a ranking for positions. And Jalen Holland is ranked number 27th in the country as a shooting guard. For shooting guards, Jalen Holland is number 27. And right now, he has added some offers. He's gotten Missouri, New Mexico State, Washington State, national runner-up San Diego State, Oklahoma, Texas, Cincinnati, Arizona State, and I think some more are going to start coming. Just recently, i seen him online at uh, visiting Utah of the Pac-12, so that's exciting stuff. And he, he really blew up at Section 7, a huge national high school tournament in Phoenix, where a lot of D1, Division 1 college coaches were able to see him, and that's where it really started to go. So, you know, I think he'll be kind of quiet on the offer side as he goes through the high school season, and I expect him to probably maybe average 30, close to 30 points. I wouldn't be surprised, but next summer should be really, really huge for him. Then you have Daniel Jacobson, former La Cueva star. Now, he's a different story. He is he is going to be at Brewster Academy. He reclassed to uh, class of 25. He just added an offer yesterday or the day before, which is uh, Providence. Uh, Providence, I believe, of the Big East. He just added that one. And I'm looking at it. And, and the Big Ten likes him, folks. The Big Ten likes him. The Illinois, Minnesota, Purdue, Wisconsin, Creighton's in there. A good mid-major. You got Clemson of the ACC. So he can get to take on Duke and North Carolina every year. Got Xavier of Cincinnati. Boise State of the Mountain West is interested. Tulsa, New Mexico, and New Mexico State are, of course, too. And uh, his, his is a very interesting story. It's uh, He's 7'2", seven, 7'1", seven, according to verbal commits. And he's able to shoot from outside, and he really, really worked on it these last couple of years. And he has transformed himself from a very from a player who was tall, and that was his benefit, to being a player that can shoot outside, a stretch five, and that's what's really exciting. Schools like the Big Ten, especially Purdue, it seems like he's really got some action with Purdue. And I'm hearing rumors of uh, UCLA and Kentucky looking a little bit. They're kind of... You know, pulling down the uh, the the shades, the curtains, and okay, uh, who's this seven two kid who can shoot the three? That's exciting stuff. That's ex- exciting stuff. So we'll see him at Brewster Academy in New England. He's from here. His brother Eric Jake, Jacobson's going to be at La Cueva this year. He's six nine, and uh, I believe he's going to be a junior. And so he's another one that's going to be exciting to watch. And so that just tells you what's going on in the state as far as uh, players are concerned. New Mexicans going out there and making a scene on the national level. And then you have Nigel Walls who has New Mexico ties. I've reported before, probably about a year ago or a couple years ago, that he had gotten his first offer from LSU of uh, the Southeastern Conference. And he keeps adding some offers. Arkansas, Auburn. Kansas State, Ole Miss, Oklahoma, Mississippi State just recently offered. New Mexico is in there on him. So we'll see what happens with him. But he's in Houston now, and I believe he would have played for Cleveland High School in Rio Rancho. And he's a 6'9 forward. He's listed, well, he's listed as a center. He's also ranked nationally on ESPN's top uh, top 60 centers for the class of 25 at number 5. Now Daniel Jacobson hasn't been ranked yet, but let's be uh, let me uh, go back on a sidebar. Daniel Jacobson is a center and I think he'll probably be ranked in that top 60 because he's probably going to be one of the tallest there and he can shoot from outside which is a blessing. 
And I think he's going to get ranked in that top 60 as far as positional rankings for ESPN as concerned. So be on the lookout for that. So there's two kids with New Mexico ties that could be ranked, end up being ranked by this time next year in the top 60. So this is exciting stuff. And then you got Amari Brown, who I believe is going to play at Albuquerque Prep. He's, uh, he's got offers from TCU and Mississippi State. He's the son of former Lobo Greg Brown. He's a great guard, great kid. And it, he's been offered by, I believe he be, was offered by um, New Mexico and Richard Patino. So we'll, we'll see what happens there and how he does during the, uh, you know, this season uh, in the grind session. And then you got Kenyon Aguino. He has been offered by Cal Poly, Cal State Northridge. He's got all the uh, New Mexico schools looking at him right now. They've offered him Eastern, New Mexico, Western, New Mexico Highlands, and New Mexico State. So I think he's going to have a really big year, and I think he's going to do some great stuff. And I'm excited to see what's going to happen there with him. So be on the lookout for him for sure. And we got a few others that are teetering on that level. Uh, you also have Dylan Chavez, I forgot. He's going to walk on at New Mexico. So he's entering his senior year. He's going to finish out his high school career at La Cueva, which gives them, which makes them very, very formidable. And so that's some exciting stuff. And I'm going to go over real quick some, uh, some players around the state, and I'm going to reiterate some stuff. Farmington's Cody Vasterstein is looking really solid this summer, especially at the tail end here. He's shooting really well from outside now, so that's exciting to see. You have um, Nico Garcia, who uh, received an offer from Bakersfield Community College. So you have him, Josiah Fresquez, along with him. So that's a nice duel at Los Alamos right there, getting some action. I saw Lucas Turner, uh, and he looked really nice. I love his footwork. Nice outside shot. Very crafty, very shifty. He's going to be a really fun one to watch. Get up to Santa Fe to see him. I, I'm looking at Clovis and Marvin Cox and Champ Goodman, I believe is his name. I want to try to see those guys. I hear some nice things about them and uh, you got uh, Lovington's Julian Arroyo Kyle Covington I believe I hope I said his name right I'm going to double check but uh, they're looking very formidable right now as a duel and then you've got uh, you've got like Artesia's Charlie Campbell um, Clay uh, Kincaid I believe is his name I hope I'm saying that right it, those are some really nice ones to look at. And then, of course, Las Cruces. You got Lenny Washington coming up. Brandon Quirez, who could potentially be a, a player of the year in the state. He's just very tough, very formidable. And I'm liking what I've seen through him throughout the summer. And it's Covington. Kyle, Kyle Covington of Lovington. Remember the name. I I posted on my Twitter is Coast to Coast Dunk. And it looked really nice. He's a 6'4 forward for the uh, Wildcats of Lovington. So definitely check that out. And check out my Twitter because I always post everybody's offers and things like that. And if you have a highlight or something, tag me and I'll retweet you. I, I promise you that. I've always promised that. And a lot of you are taking me up on that. And that's cool. And I appreciate it. So there's a few others that, are, you know, cross my mind. Kareem Atne. Kareem Atne of Manzano is another one that, that is really developing nicely into a player. Uh, Santiago Gonzalez of Rio Grande. And is another one. And then you got Latavius Morris and Marquise Renfro of uh, Atrisco. Another nice group coming up there at Atrisco. They're very competitive. And uh, as we go along, you got you got plenty of other players. Daniel Staverson, Remy Albrecht of uh, Cleveland, and then Jaden Johnson of Rio Rancho. I'm going to go over all these guys in the next podcast and give you a breakdown uh, of the state in 4A and 5A and we're definitely going to have a lot of fun. So just to recap all this stuff, I think uh, just to recap the whole show, 
I think um, New Mexico State and Greg Heyer are not done with each other. And I think the state of New Mexico is going to step in and we're going to have some fireworks and we're going to have some more revealing stuff. And that's going to come in 2024. So be on the lookout for it, and I'm definitely going to report it. I think there's going to be some great stuff. I, I'm believing Greg Heyer, and I'm thinking that he was truly a, a sacrificial lamb, a scapegoat. And uh, just uh, just get out there and support your uh, your student athletes out there. You've got uh, you got a lot of guys that are are getting D1 offers, like Jalen Hall and Nigel Walls. Daniel Jacobson, Amari Brown, fill up those gyms. Fill up those gyms. In fact, uh, there's fall league schedule going on. You can go check out these teams play against each other. There's usually four or five games going on uh, every Sunday, and they generally start at 1 o'clock at an APS high school. So if you don't know the schedule, just hit me up. Some nice people have been able to give me the schedule, so it's been awesome. And uh, with that, uh, I'll just close with that on the 26th episode. It was mainly about Greg Hire and New Mexico State. But I'm definitely going to do episode 27. Talk about all the players. I want you to look out for my car talk episodes now where I just talk in the car. I'm going to talk about reclassification. Reclass is the new high school red shirt. Right? It's a great title. I saw it on an article. I wish I could give credit to whoever wrote it. Um, I'm going to talk about that in the, in a car talk episode, about 10, 15 minutes or so. So definitely check those things out. So with that, I thank you for watching. I thank you for playing. And you guys, have a great night wherever you are at. Have a great day. Good night.